here talking to Simon Townsley, who's just come back from a month in the Ukraine, uh, covering the desperate situation there. And today's topic um, is uh, possibly triggering uh, for some people. We're going to talk about some of the things that Simon uh, saw. We, yeah, we went to, so there are particular things in a war that tell a story and that you make an effort to, to look up, apart from being on the front line with the soldiers. And those are hospitals, morgues, churches, graveyards, you know, those are the areas where you find uh, the real story of what's going on um, in the wars, the refugee centres, um, you know, you don't have to be, in fact, it's not always a great idea to be on the front line with people because wars are really about civilian populations being displaced and destroyed. We went to uh, Mikolaev, which is a couple of hours drive east of Odessa and very much a front line um, at that time, although I think the Russians have been pushed back a bit from there now. Um, but it's certainly strategically critical and I suspect will be the site of a lot of fighting um, in the future, or could well be. Um, so we went to the morgue there um, because we'd been speaking to colleagues about what we might expect to find. And when I turned up, I wasn't quite prepared for, I mean, I've been in a lot of morgues, but I wasn't prepared quite the level of um, chaos, really. There were a lot of full body packs um, spread on the ground. It was clear that the morgue had overflowed into a number of outbuildings and they weren't entirely coping with the volume of um, uh, bodies that were being brought in and they just hadn't processed them and they were taking the bodies, briefly examining them and then delivering them directly to these outbuildings and just stacking them, in some cases, on top of each other. They're running out of space. I think there were probably 50, maybe more bodies in these, these two quite big rooms. Um, well, not big enough. And unfortunately, uh, it was very cold. So that kind of kept things a bit more under control. Some people might be thinking, um, boy, you know, going to a morgue with a camera. What, you know, talk to me about why that's important and you know, a, a, a part of the, uh, you know, the, the reporting that you wanted to do? Yeah, for a number of reasons. I mean, in the first instance, you, you can verify what's going on in terms of um, the dead, you know, how many people are dying and who's dying. Are they soldiers? Are they civilians? Um, and kind of what rate are they dying at? Where are they dying? Where are they coming in from? And then you also get a sense of the human tragedy, really, by seeing the people who are affected, the people who are left behind. So when we were there, um, uh, most most of the bodies were, were soldiers, I would say, um, about eighty percent. Um, but when we were there, um, a mother arrived um, to collect her twenty-two-year-old son who'd been killed, and you know, and that's where you see the effect of a war. You know, it's, I can show you photographs of shattered bodies and it will repulse you, but it won't give you a real sense of what it must be like to have to uh, contend with seeing your own child in that condition, finding them and everything that goes with that. So, yeah, I mean, it's certainly not normal to take a camera there, but it would be um, wholly wrong not to, I think. Yeah. What do you say then? Well, because if you don't photograph things, then you're not paying attention to the suffering of, uh, you know, of the situation of the people in the situation. You're not taking care of, to tell the stories of, not, not, in, not only of the, the, the dead, but the stories of the people who are left behind. That's the responsibility that journalists have. You've, you're there to be a mouthpiece and as offensive as your presence might be, most of the time people want to say, this was my son, this is what, his life meant to me 
and this is what his loss means and let me tell you about him. You know, in the case of Irina, who was the woman who arrived to um, pick up her little boy, she was very distressed and to start with I think she was uncomfortable and then very quickly thought very little of me um, being there to photograph her because she had bigger things on her mind. And she took her phone out and started showing me all the photographs of him as a baby and you know through his life and the last photo she had of him and she was telling me about him and then she was telling me how she felt about the war and what what it meant to her what it meant to have russians invading her country you know that that's that's the whole point of it of me that's the point of me being there and what'd she say well she was she was screaming, how can you do this? How can you take my child like this? Why would you take him? He was 22 years old. He's just a baby. Why did you do that? You know, here he is. I hadn't seen him for a month. And now look at him here. Look at him. What have you done to him? You know, why? Russian, why Putin's doing this? Why are you doing this? So she was really expressing this kind of horror um, at the, the pointlessness. But she couldn't understand it. And frankly, um, Nobody seems to be able to understand it. What is the point of it? So those are the questions to ask, but it's not for me to ask, it's for, for those people to ask and then for me to kind of try and express that for them. And of course, there's, um, there's, there's a propaganda, there's an information war yeah. um, in, in process here and your photographs have been um, regularly on the front page and other pages of the Telegraph. Yeah. And of course, these are uh, global newspapers um, that are read around the world. Um, and it's hard to argue with a photograph, isn't it? You'd be surprised. I mean, people argue that black is white, you know, and it's even more important now with social media and so much misinformation flying around that people get their news from verifiable sources, I think. Um, so in terms of the propaganda war, you know, who are you going to trust? And what level of proof do you require, you know, is it enough for me to tell you and show you the photographs that I've taken? Not necessarily. And so I think we have to kind of reinforce that and build on that. But, you know, I was working in a hospital there and photographing um, three children in a ward, all of them who've been um, either shot or shot, leaving Mariupol. And we were interviewing the doctor in English, who I understood. And I was photographing and could hear this interview in the background. And the doctor said, you know, his Russian friends and relatives didn't believe it. They thought it was fake. They thought it was fake. They thought those pictures had been taken in a different conflict or at a different time or were just generally fake. And so I'm pointing my lens at a girl who was shot in the face, an 11-year-old gymnast who'd been travelling through a Russian checkpoint and they'd opened fire on her family and she'd been hit in the face. The bullet had gone through and lodged next to her carotid artery, fortunately. They managed to get it out. Um, but she was so distressed when I went there, you know, she was on a ventilator and was in real distress because she, the sedation had just slightly worn off when I arrived and so she was terribly upset and, um, yeah, I mean, I want to tell you, it wasn't fake, but people won't necessarily believe it, but there you go. And uh, you visited churches as well. Yeah, and I think churches are really critical because, um, you know, in, you know, the, particularly in, in Russia and Ukraine, you know, it, it is kind of, um, a very big part of their culture, the Orthodox Church, and the Ukrainian Orthodox Church is broken away, but uh, the Russian Orthodox Church has still got a big influence, and Putin is very reliant on the, the Orthodox Church to give him um, a degree of credence and sort of uh, credibility, I should say, and so uh, the, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, um, you know, clearly they're not happy about things, but there are a lot of Russian Orthodox Church members who, you know, one guy who we met, um, um, Father Dmitri, he said, um, well, the thing is, you know, what else could Russia do? The West brought it on, you know, they kept sending weapons in here, and so the Russians could do nothing but invade, they're threatened, and that's what they did. And so these are quite interesting points of view to take into account, that, that level of threat, and what can you do to mitigate against, you know, people feeling threatened? I mean, I, mean, I think he's wrong, he's, in my opinion, he's clearly wrong, but it was really important to meet him. And hear his story, and... and it was his view, do you think, formed by Russian media that he was consuming, or is is was that genuinely a sort of independent, objective observation of what was going on? Well, I don't know where he got his news from. Um, I suspect it kind of lives within the community as a 
sort of generally accepted idea that um, you know they feel very much that they were under threat and and Ukraine didn't do itself any favors by being you know already having quite a high level of corruption so you know that trustworthiness of local media might not have been as high as it needed to be. You mentioned, and it's a difficult question to ask, you mentioned also graves, going to grave sites. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about that. Well, you know, this is where, again, you know, you can get an idea of, of the, the number of people who are being buried and, and the reaction of families where you meet families who have lost people. Um, so we, we did go to a, a graveyard um, after a mass burial, 26 or 27, soldiers had been buried in a graveyard. And what was interesting was that um, there were four times that number of graves prepared. So while well, there were, it was a line of um, graves already occupied, um, they were clearly expecting a lot more people to come for that. So that was... Um, and, and they were collective graves rather than individual? Well, no, they weren't mass graves, but they were, um, it was like a military cemetery where there were, rows. you know, a row, rows of graves. So they were individual graves. Yeah, yeah that wasn't desperately heart-wrenching. Um, thank you for sharing it. We're going to continue to talk about some of these topics, um, tough as it may be.